Good evening. Welcome to Spotlight. Tonight, warnings over the pressure on A&E at one of our main hospitals. A record number of people have turned up at the emergency department of the Royal Devon and Exeter, but doctors say many shouldn't have been there. We are very keen to encourage the public to only attend here when they know that they need to be seen in an A&E. Hello, also in the programme this evening, raped at 16 by a senior clergyman. The man who was sexually abused talked to us for the first time about his ordeal. The best in the South West, Flavour Fest showcases outstanding regional produce. And we're live at Eden as BBC Music Day draws to a conclusion with a grand finale concert featuring headline act Duran Duran. Patients are being warned tonight not to use A&E at one of the region's main hospitals unless it's absolutely necessary. Managers at the Royal Devon and Exeter say it's become so busy that patients with more serious conditions are being put at risk. Well, in a normal day, the hospital would treat around 240 patients in A&E. But with the bank holiday pressures and school half-term holiday, that number rose to nearly 400 on Tuesday as the hospital experienced its busiest ever day in A&E in its history. And there are fears that number will rise further this weekend. Well, Hamish Marshall is live there for us tonight. Hamish. Well, Justin, winter pressures in our hospitals are something that's been well documented over the last few years, but it seems as if those pressures are spreading to the accident and emergency departments in other times of the year as well. And it's led staff at hospitals right across the region to ask anyone who does feel they need to come to A&D to ask themselves, are you going to make it your last resort rather than your first option? Some health issues need a trip to A&D, but are there some people in the waiting room who should be getting treatment elsewhere? Experienced staff who say every day here is busy believe the answer is yes. It can be really, really frustrating for both the staff and also for other members of the public that are actually waiting. There are lots of other areas um, and avenues available to people to get their care, for example, pharmacy, walk-in centres and GPs. And a lot of what our staff have to deal with is actually dealing with the expectations and the frustrations of members of the public that come into the department. And it can be more serious than just frustration. All arrivals need to be triaged vetting to see who needs treatment quickest. Any delay could be crucial. We saw very nearly 400 patients uh, on Tuesday that we may not get to someone with a really pressing need in time and clearly that's a cause for concern. So we are very keen to encourage the public to only attend here when they know that they need to be seen in an A&E, when they have a serious injury or they're seriously ill. There is an NHS-wide trend for more people to use A&D the challenge is to encourage people to use the other routes to treatment available. The casualty departments are being busier when GP practices like mine are actually open. So it is busier during the weekdays, not the weekends. So first of all, if you live here locally, call your local GP or ask your pharmacist. If you're not sure what to do, ring 111 and they will give you the advice as to where best to go. Much has been said about winter pressures on the NHS. But the worry is that this week, with the population expanded due to school holidays, could be a sign of problems ahead through this summer. And it's not just here. The Royal Cornwall Hospital reported its busiest ever Saturday in A&E two weeks ago. And last week at Derriford Hospital in Plymouth, it had 345 cases. On a normal day, it would deal with 260. The real concern is that those who need the treatment most face the danger of going towards the end of a queue and delaying that treatment they need. Thank you, Hamish. Next tonight, a victim of sexual abuse within the church has spoken to Spotlight for the first time about his ordeal. The man, who we're calling Joe to protect his real identity, was raped by a Church of England chancellor in 1976 when he was just 16. He says he tried for years to raise his fears over safeguarding in the church with senior clergy, including the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, and the Bishop of Truro, Tim Thornton, but was met with silence. He's been speaking to Donna Birrell. 
Now in his 50s, Joe says the abuse he suffered at the hands of clergyman Garth Moore was made even worse by the way the Church of England handled his case over the following four decades. He says he refused to stay silent and told senior clergy, including the Right Reverend Tim Thornton, who was Bishop of Sherborne in 2003. I told him very clearly, very clearly, I told him where I was raped, I told him who it was, and I told him something of the impact that that had had on my life. Bishop Tim Thornton has said very publicly that he remembers meeting you, but he doesn't remember the disclosure of abuse. And if he had remembered, he would have followed the correct protocol and reported it. Well, he didn't. He, he didn't do anything. In January 2015, the Bishop of Truro, Tim Thornton, wrote to Joe to apologise for having no memory of any disclosure of abuse. Last year, an independent review by the safeguarding expert Ian Elliott was carried out into the way the Church of England handled Joe's case. As Ian Elliott says, a disturbing feature of my case is that uh, many people that I told do remember my disclosures, but all the senior people don't. Joe says up until the review, his concerns over safeguarding had been repeatedly ignored at the highest levels. I raised them at Lambeth Palace through nearly two dozen emails, letters, all blanked and just completely ignored, apart from a polite go-away letter from the correspondence clerk of the Archbishop of Canterbury. Have when you ever had a response from the Archbishop of Canterbury? No, nothing. I was just completely shut off. And these were letters that the Bishop of Durham could see, that Tim Thornton could see, others in the church could see. So I was emailing them all together, trying desperately to get uh, somebody in the church to recognize these issues as important. It wasn't until the Elliott Review happened that the issues were taken up. The Bishop of Crediton, Sarah Mullally, has been tasked with ensuring the points from the review are rolled out across the Church of England as soon as possible. Speaking on their behalf, she says she's encouraged that the House of Bishops has given full support to lead on implementing the recommendations, but equally is aware that for survivors this won't seem soon enough. And she repeated the Church's apology to Joe, who she says suffered appalling abuse in this case. Donna Birrell, BBC Spotlight. Well, Joe's case has prompted the Church of England to make wide-ranging changes to the way it deals with young people. Justin Humphreys is head of the Church's Child Protection Advisory Service. I asked him why Joe had met a wall of silence when he tried to raise his abuse with senior members of the Church. The Church of England does have guidance, indeed called responding well, uh, to those who have been sexually abused. But I think what we found is that that was not always practised uh, as it should have been, um, individuals within the church were not aware of what they should have been doing um, and information's got lost and, and Joe has been very persistent in trying to bring his issues to the fore. It seems very hard to believe though, why, why would that have been happening, that people weren't following procedures, weren't picking up on something as serious as the allegations that Joe was putting forward? I think there could be a number of explanations for that, but I think principally uh, there is an issue of training at, at stake here. Why does anyone need training to act upon something as serious as someone claiming they've been raped by a member of the clergy? No one needs training on that. That, that should be common sense to report that to the police and investigate thoroughly. Sure, you, you would think so. We, we would like to think so. Um, and the Church's Child Protection Advisory Service advises the church in all traditions and denominations on such issues. But yes, you would expect that senior clergy are very clear about what needs to happen in situations like this. And so the proposals put forward include now additional training for people such as bishops. What form do you hope that will take? Well, the training would need to address a whole range of different issues, but it would need to be practice-based, it would need to look at case studies, it would need to be easily applicable to the role of uh, clergy at all levels to make sure that it resonates with where they are and what they do. If all goes according to plan, if someone else in the future puts claims forward such as Joe has of such a serious nature, how do you think they will be dealt with? 
I'd like to think that they would be dealt with in a more appropriate way than they have been so far. There's a key issue in terms of how advice is given to the Church of England um, and how that is followed. Uh, what the review found was that actually the Church of England needs to make sure that it adheres to its policy and procedures, which are there and are clear before it takes the advice of others, which may actually take them down a different route. OK, Justin Humphreys, thank you very much indeed. Pleasure. Now, what Poldark did for Cornwall, Broad Church is doing for Dorset. The TV programme has brought visitors to the filming location near Bridport, with hits on the Visit Dorset website increasing to two and a half million. The third and final series will be again filmed in West Bay later this year. Our Dorset reporter Simon Cleverson has the story. As a film set, it's got a lot to thank 185 million years of history for. The Jurassic Coast, nature's own blockbuster backdrop. In its latest incarnation on TV, this is the scene of gritty crime. But in reality, it is, of course, a holiday destination. And for some, one has led to the other. Well, we watched it on TV and thought, what a nice place, the sound looks nice. You know, mm. and, uh, so, I I said to wife, so I Googled it and found out where the location was. And uh, it's a fantastic place. We had a look to see where we could camp nearby. And we're staying... Um, just up the road, so it's nice. The board church has brought you down here? Yeah, yeah, definitely. How does it feel when West Bay, Broadchurch's alter ego, is a constant as each series brings a new case for the detectives and Dorset to millions of people around the country. So just how valuable is primetime exposure? Well, this ice cream hut is closed and yet it could fetch up to £65,000 at auction, a high price for what it is. A recent study found three quarters of local businesses felt Broadchurch had boosted trade and new figures reveal the Visit Dorset website now gets up to two and a half million hits a year. The stars are very well known and they have their own Twitter accounts and their own Facebook pages. We send a message out from Dorchester, it then goes via David Tennant's account and they're followed by their own followers and Ant and Deck for example, we got a message about a holiday in West Dorset beamed far and wide by someone like Ant and Deck. And the film crews keep coming, making the most of what is proving very valuable for Dorset. Reels and reels of scenery. Simon Clemerson, BBC Spotlight, West Bay. Now, if you haven't had your evening meal yet, this will make you feel hungry. Whiskey, cheddar, lavender and nectar fudge, coconut and passion fruit liqueur. Sounds like an advert for a food company, doesn't it? But those are just some of the de delicacies on offer at one of the South West's largest food and drink festivals. More than 120 traders are showcasing some of the region's best produce over the next three days. Spotlight's Janine Jensen reports from the annual Plymouth Flavour Fest. Yes, welcome to the annual Plymouth Flavour Fest. So much locally produced food and drink on offer here. Something for everyone. Now, if you've got a sweet tooth, perhaps you'd like this. Something like this fudge. Look at that lavender and nectar fudge. Absolutely delicious. Now, if you've got more of a savoury tooth, try these pies here. Look at this game pie. Look at the size of them beef and Guinness pie. I can guarantee you, if you come here, you will find something that you like. Every colour, every taste, something for everyone. Hundreds turned out for a little indulgence. What is this you're making? Uh, this is a Nutella crepe with um, banana and strawberries, so a nice, healthy summer crepe. Absolutely fantastic. Can't get a better place to live in Plymouth, can you? You've got all this on your doorstep, so it's fab. Oh, this looks delicious. What is this? This is infused chicken saffron. It's like it melts in your mouth. That's, that's, that's how I can explain it, really. <laughs> BBC Radio Devon presenters Simon Bates and David Fitzgerald battled it out in the Ready Steady Cook Challenge. There was a little cheating from Fitz. Out of order, I know. I Just, do apologise. Yeah, no, no, I can't fine. believe that you would do that. So I can report Mr Bates was declared the winner. Well, I've got myself a couple of samples, a giant cookie, um, some jammy dodgems. Can I have that giant, uh, yes, gingerbread man, lovely. I've also got myself a billionaire's shortbread, billionaire's flapjack. Pity I can't find a billionaire. Well, just loving my job. Hope there's some left for you on Saturday and Sunday. Janine Jansen, BBC Spotlight, Plymouth.
I don't think there will be, will there? No, I think Janine's had it all. It's gorgeous. <laughs> I was down there today, absolutely gorgeous. Lovely crab sandwich I had. Ooh. It's a fantastic event. I noticed none of it came back here. Though. Sorry. No, I was hungry. I it all, my love. <laughs> <laughs> now, it's BBC Music Day, and across the country from early this morning, people have been celebrating music, which brings together communities and generations. Yes, there have been lots of events across the region, and we'll hear more about those in a moment. But one of the biggest is taking place tonight at the Eden Project in Cornwall, and our reporter, Rebecca, Wills is there for us tonight, Rebecca. Yes, thank you very much, Justin. The atmosphere and the crowds are certainly building here at Eden. As BBC Music Day draws to a close with a grand finale, a concert featuring the headline act, Duran Duran. And I am so delighted to say that Roger Taylor from the band has spared us a few moments to talk to us now. Roger, when you got the call saying, do you want to be involved in Music Day, did the band hesitate at all? Uh, no, we didn't actually. Uh, I'm, we've heard a lot about this place but never actually been here. So the, the, the opportunity to come play here as well was just, uh, we couldn't refuse it. And also the BBC are involved in it and it's going live on radio too. So the whole package was uh, pretty attractive. Now you've been out on the stage already this afternoon doing your sound check. What do you make of it as a venue? Amazing, isn't it? I mean, just look at it. It's incredible. I mean, it's, there's, I don't think there's anything quite like it in the world that I've been to and to have it here in England is uh, it's something quite special. And you're certainly a draw because you are a, a sellout tonight. Um, the fans coming along will obviously be expecting to hear some of the classics but you're also playing some uh, tracks from your most recent album Paper Gods. Tell exactly, us a little bit yes. about that. Uh, yeah we're just out on the road promoting it at the moment. Uh, we recorded it in London. It took a long time. It was a real labour of love so it's great to be out here now playing it to our audience and they seem to you know, they really accept the, the new material. It's not kind of like the, the toilet break where everyone rushes off to the, the loo or the bar. It's like people are actually really loving the new stuff, so that, that's great. Yeah. And when you sit down to write new music, are you really aware of sort of the heritage of the heydays of the 1980s, or are you really trying to make it more relevant to what's happening in the music industry today? Uh, we try not to think about that too much, because if we were just trying to live up to the... To the 80s the early days i mean it would just be so difficult to write new material so we we just try and stay where we are right now we, we we're, we're big fans of kind of staying in the moment and and just really focusing on what we're doing now and then we find that's the only way to to really work but of course we do go out and we play the classics and we we'll never deny our audience that you know we, we we know it's very important to get out there and play the the early material as well does that ever get a bit stale though because as you say as artists you're moving forward and you kind of think oh here we are we've got to go back and play the reflex or something uh not really i mean we, we rehearse these songs and you, you know i've played planet earth probably a million times when you get in front of the audience and the audience kind of they make the songs come alive, you know, and they, they, there's so much love for those earlier songs that they just come alive when we play them live. So I think we'll, we'll always be uh, playing them. Now, obviously, Music Day is to celebrate all sorts of genres of music. What is it about music that you think just hooks people in? Because even if it's a classical track or a country track, people just love music. It is the soundtrack to their lives. Yeah, I mean, we play all over the world and it's the same. I mean, we play in countries where a lot of people probably don't even really understand the lyrics. You know, we go down to the Far East and places like that and it just seems to be an international language, doesn't it? That just, there's something about humans, isn't there, that just adore music and we're, we're very lucky to be able to be in a position to, to do that for people. And so very briefly, what's the track you're most looking forward to playing tonight? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I think Pressure Off, it's a track off the new album, off the Paper Gods album. And it's such a great song to play. Yeah, I love it. Well, good luck. Thank you very much indeed. I know there's thousands of people out there in yeah, their yeah, auditorium who are just waiting to get hold of you. So thank you for sparing thank us you. some Thanks time. So that was Roger Taylor, the drummer with Duran Duran. And as we said, BBC Music Day has been happening right across the corporation from early this morning till late tonight. 11 o'clock, Duran Duran will finish playing. And my colleague, Andy Burkett, has been taking a look at some of the other events that have been taking place here in the southwest. Close your eyes, feel the heat, and you could be on the streets of Havana. But this was St. Austell, and the flavor of the Americas had come up the A30 from Penzance. Cabasa, just one of the acts on show for BBC's Music Day. 
everybody understands music, you know, it's something sort of primeval that touches people, people want to engage with it. There's a lot of foot tapping going on when they're hearing this music playing, it's, it's an innate instinct. And there's even something here for those of us without a musical bone in our body. That wasn't actually that bad, was it? I wouldn't give it your day job. Hint taken. Lessons were available, but the day job meant there wasn't time. Whether you're into trialling trumpets or clattering cutlery, today was about making noise and having fun, even for big kids. Uh, it's so different from what we do in everyday life. We really encourage people to come and be creative, to come and explore and have a play and access their inner child, and adults love it. <laughs> Despite the salsa and the samba, all the musicians here have a Cornish connection. But elsewhere, the connection was bridges. Local artists put on special performances alongside the Royal Albert Bridge in Saltash and the Long Bridge in Biddeford. The bridges symbolising how music can help bring people together. Take it to the bridge, a music day to celebrate music as well as historical architecture. To be here today and get to sing to Biddeford and to represent the South West is just amazing. Back in Cornwall, the Cuban daydream was over. It was now the turn for a much more traditional Cornish sound. A day set aside to celebrate music of all kinds and to unite young and old seemed to have done just that. Andy Burkett, BBC Spotlight, St Austell. Now, if I was excited about uh, meeting a member of Duran Duran, I tell you one man who's even more excited, and that's BBC Radio Cornwall's David White. He's on air right now actually. He started at six o'clock. He's broadcasting until 11 o'clock tonight right across BBC Southwest. Earlier I caught up with him and I will warn you now he was in a great deal of excitement about the night to come. So David you're on air until 11 o'clock yeah. tonight. What's coming up? I can't wait. Um, well we've got the whole of the Duran Duran concert um, from uh, around about quarter past nine I think they're gonna be on stage and if you're thinking oh, do you know what I didn't really like Duran Duran back in the 80s or the 90s or maybe but I'll tell you what I heard them sound check this afternoon <laughs> oh they were fantastic they were awesome maybe it's because they did one of my favorite songs three times one after the other which was notorious oh, yeah. but uh, they were they sounded brilliant and I tell you what as well there's some pyrotechnics that's going to go off tonight so it, it's going to be amazing and how big a deal do you think it is for Cornwall that the big finale of music day is coming live from Eden can you not tell how excited <laughs> I am I mean, honestly Calm down here. yeah I really I mean it, I think for, for Cornwall it's massive I think I think first of all BBC music day is huge it's in its second year and, and it's it's grown definitely than what it was last year I mean we might we might be looking at it through rose-coloured glasses in the sense because it's here, maybe, but I think it's grown. We've had lots more interest in it, uh, and I think the fact that we've got it down here in such an iconic venue, and the weather, thank you, the weather, it's, it's just going to be amazing. I, I'm, I'm, oh, you can tell, can't you? I'm so <laughs> excited. And you're live on BBC Radio Cornwall yeah. and online? Yeah, and we're online. We're on BBC Radio Cornwall, BBC Radio Devon, BBC Radio Jersey and Guernsey and online. So wherever you are, you can hear this concert, uh, and you're not going to be disappointed, honestly. I've spoken to Izzy Bazoo. Um, she's playing. We, we're dipping in, in and out of her. We've got Laura Mvula, who also is spectacular when she sound checked earlier. She was wonderful. <laughs> and of course, Duran Duran. Brilliant. And Nile Rogers. Come Amazing. on. What more do you want? Well, there is one man who's certainly going to have a good night tonight. Yeah, have a lovely I can't show. Wait. Thank you. <laughs> Well, as you can tell, the excitement here at Eden is really ramping up to fever pitch. You might be able to see behind me the crowds are gathering. That's because the one show is live from here at 7 o'clock, straight after Spotlight. No need to go anywhere with continued coverage of BBC Music Day. As I said, David is on air on BBC Southwest until 11 o'clock tonight. And if you'd like to see highlights of what's been happening here, you can do that on BBC One at Sunday at 11 o'clock at night with all a roundup of Music Day. I'm a bit worn out now, so I'm going to hand back to our original girl on film and the wild boy, Natalie and Justin. <laughs> and Natalie is now going to give us a rendition of... Planet Earth. No, no. I'm not going to give you a rendition of anything. <laughs> Brilliant. I thought for music day you might sing. No, I don't think I will. I think we can spare no, people I'm that. I'm not going to either. Terrible, but we have got something to sing about, hopefully, with the weather, Dan. Am I right? <laughs> yeah, not looking too bad overall for the weekend, Natalie. One or two niggles, but in the main, it's looking pretty good Lovely. for the weekend. Hello there, good evening. Yes, uh, as I was saying, some fine weather over the weekend, but the first niggle is it will be a bit cloudier to start the weekend. That's uh, for Saturday. 
by uh, Sunday, though, things are really brightening up again and it will feel increasingly warm through the weekend, perhaps a bit humid at times as well. The other niggle is the risk of a few isolated showers and they could be on the heavy side, perhaps a bit thundery, but uh, the clues are in the word isolated. I think many of us are getting by with a completely dry weekend. Here's what's going on then. You can see the satellite picture, a definite split between east and west. Again, we're on the uh, brighter side, on the uh, cooler side towards uh, Lincolnshire, Norfolk, for example. They've only seen 12 or 13 degrees today. We managed 21 at Chivener this afternoon. This is what's going on then. Unusually, we've got the weather fronts coming from the east to the west, and this one here is dragging in the cloud overnight tonight and to start tomorrow. Once it comes through, though, things are starting to brighten up, particularly for Sunday, but always the risk of one or two heavy showers, and we keep that shower risk into Monday as well. But with light winds in any sunshine, it will feel quite pleasant. Taking a closer look then, and again, you can see the cloud as it sweeps around. Sunshine here. We did see a bit of cloud in Torbay earlier today, and our friends in the Channel Islands have been holding on to the cloud for longer. But for most of us, it's been lovely beach weather through today, and that was a good excuse for our cameraman, Paul Moxham, to pop down to above his sand and uh, maybe dip his toes in the water. But uh, it's certainly been a pleasant day here, several people making the most of the sunshine today and actually getting into the sea. The sea temperature is still only about 13 degrees, so not, not quite sure I'd be persuaded to go in there just let, yet, but uh, nice weather nonetheless. So in, back to tonight then, and you can uh, see through the course of the evening, it's uh, fine, but overnight that cloud starting to push into eastern areas, reaching Somerset and Dorset and Devon through the course of the night. The wind's light overnight though, and our temperatures similar to last night. It's not likely to fall much below 7 or 8 degrees. So to start tomorrow, mixed fortunes. I think the further west you are, for the Isles of Surrey into Cornwall, certainly the likelihood of the brightest weather here, but cloudier further to the east, maybe a few mist patches around first thing. But hopeful through the morning, we will start to see that cloud lift and break up a bit, some brighter spells into the afternoon. But that does bring the risk of one or two heavy thundery showers. But I think for most of us, it should stay dry right through and feeling quite pleasant in any sunshine, a bit warmer than today even. Highs of around 21 degrees. The Isles are silly, well, as I say, further west, so seeing the better of the sunshine, sunny spells, feeling warm and uh, light winds, and our times of high water. Let's uh, go to Biddeford today at 04.50 tomorrow morning, and again at 17.17 tomorrow afternoon. Not a great deal of surf around at the moment. I think we'll struggle to see much more than two or three feet with the light winds. And our coastal waters forecast see the wind northeasterly at first, but becoming variable, force three or four or lighter. The risk of a thundery shower for a time, generally moderate or good visibility, though. So our outlook then, and tomorrow, as I say, there's some cloud around at first, but becoming brighter, and then it's mostly bright and dry for Sunday, just the risk of a few thundery showers around, and feeling warm too, perhaps a bit humid, a similar picture into Monday and Tuesday. Some bright spells, but also the risk of a few thundery showers. Have yourself a good weekend. Back to you, team. Thank you very much, Dan. And that's all from us for tonight. BBC Music Day continues next on The One Show and we'll leave you this evening with The View live at the Eden Project. From all of us here, have a good weekend. Bye-bye, take care.